Uh, one of the biggest things that I hear coming from my clients is, you know, they don't teach business in law school. And it's almost gotten to a point where attorneys are using it as a defensive flag of saying, this is why I'm not successful, rather than trying to figure out how to fix that problem and educate themselves on becoming somebody who's educated in business. And I'll even say this, I have an MBA and I went through all the classes needed to become an MBA. And there's zero that was taught about running a small business when you go for your MBA. So going to business school probably wouldn't have prepared you for running a law firm anyway. So what's the solution for somebody who's, I don't know how to run a business, but I want to, I want to run my own law firm. I think the first step is your mindset. I mean, there's a great book you know, by Carol Dweck called Mindset. And uh, it's one of the first books I read when I was thinking about becoming a businessman, which is just to have a mindset that you want to learn. And I find that a lot of lawyers, it's kind of weird. Um, we think of ourselves as professionals instead of businessmen, businessmen because we're taught from an early age how special we are. And we're not special. We just happen to have a good brain and happen to be lucky enough to go to law school and enter into a good career. So if you have a mindset that you want to continuously learn, I mean, I'm, you know, middle-aged dude. I still go to three, four, five seminars a year. I still pick up a, a few morsels at each seminar. And I think that's how I started my career. And that's how I'm ultimately going to end my career is that you don't want to stop learning. So, you know, if you want to learn business, start reading books, start becoming a member of organizations or courses such as yours, Moshe, where everyone's into learning and collaborating and helping. So the fact that I had a father-in-law with, that taught me some of this stuff was definitely very helpful. But at that time, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have Facebook groups. We didn't have anything in the late 1990s. Uh, you know, I just had my father-in-law and there weren't that many seminars. So the fact that these days for someone who's young, there's so many opportunities, so many knowledge resources, so many Facebook groups and seminars. I don't think it's that difficult. I think if you go to all these groups and really immerse yourself in the organizations that teach, that it's just as good as having a mentor or a tribe of mentors as, as the book. There's a book called Tribe of Mentors. So, you know, having a tribe of mentors is really easy these days. I think it's bringing up the fact that it's really easy is something that we should caution our listeners about because you kind of need to make a decision about who your mentor is going to be or who your group of mentors are going to be. But it's easy to get torn in different directions and actually be given different messages from the different mentors that are out there. And there isn't a right or wrong way. Uh, one of the reasons that I went into the legal community and said, here, I'm going to teach you how to grow your business. I'm going to teach, I mean, we call this podcast profit with law, right? So many people were focusing on top line revenue. How do I get my revenue to be, you know, I want to be a million dollar firm. If you're focusing on being a million dollar firm, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Focus on how, how you can take home 250,000. And when you get, when you figure that out, you'll probably be a million dollar firm. But the problem is, is that we're focusing on that, on that, on the wrong number. So a lot of attorneys who are teaching other attorneys how to do it, they're, they're they came into the marketplace saying, here's how I did it. I'm going to show you how to do it. And that doesn't work for everybody. So that's really where I started, you know, working with lawyers is to say, Hey, I didn't do it. I'm not an attorney. I understand business, no matter what practice area you're in, no matter what business you're in, I'm going to show you how a business is run. I'm going to show you what's important and we're going to focus on that. And I think that really it's, you know, you, what you're said about mindset and being willing to learn is ultra important, but also recognizing that you can go the hard way. You can try to figure these things out yourself and learn from your own mistakes, or you can join somebody who can be in your corner, who can be your coach, who can help you to see the things that you're not seeing and give you some sort of success path that you can follow so that you're not figuring it all out on your own. Uh, so I love that as, as, as the, the first stepping stone. How does somebody figure out whether they should have a marketing budget, what their marketing budget should be. Is there a formula to figure out what to spend or invest on marketing for the growth of your firm based on where you're at? Yeah. So there are a couple of uh, places that will go with this. I'll start from the marketing framework and, and, and then Moshe, I'm going to turn us into a revenue per employee metric, which I promise for everyone listening, you're going to want to hear this because any law firm owner who has ever struggled with the idea of 
where am I in relation to my peers? Which let's be honest, that's part sometimes of being a lawyer. It's why sometimes lawyers can be high income, low wealth because they're looking around at their peers and thinking, well, I need to be closer to where they are in lifestyle because they don't know the back end of any of this stuff. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about that as well, but up front with the marketing. So first thing I'll say is like marketing, advertising will be where I can pay a real number on it, right? Marketing, marketing costs are always greater than your advertising costs because marketing costs might be uh, hiring someone to answer the phone externally who has a better customer service thing before it comes inside for the intake specialist. Marketing can be the swag giveaways that you have when someone comes in that we can't put a direct return on investment on, but we know gets our brand out deeper and deeper into the community and improves our ability to provide high-end experiences and get more referrals. Now, advertising, which every, and this is one of the mistakes that are made, every law firm should have an advertising budget. And an advertising budget should be, that's, that's like, here's the marketing that we're doing. If we're doing this kind of a, a narrow it down term, we would also call this media buying, right? I mean, these are terms that you know well, Moshe. These are terms that folks in your audience may know well, but this might help put some definition on it. So, Am I buying local service ads from Google? Am I buying pay-per-click from Bing and Google, Facebook ads, direct mail, print advertising, television, radio, all of that stuff? The advertising budget, you know, the ranges can be pretty extreme, but usually what I'm looking for when I'm working with a firm, and a lot of the firms that we work with are under $5 million a year. I'm going to look for that firm to spend in the range of seven to 12% on advertising. And this Moshe is really important depending on where they are in their journey. So, uh, and I, I want to, I want to jump in real quick and yeah. also depending on where they want to go in their journey. Right. Yes. Um, I have people who, you know, they're like, Oh, well, what should, what should it be? I actually just want one more client a month. Well, if you want one more client a month. Don't, don't spend money on advertising. Let's find another way to bring one more client a month. In. Yep. Yep. So it's, yeah. a, it's very much a matter of, scale, right? If you are a firm, let's say today you're running a million dollar a year family law practice, right? And you're thinking to yourself, how do I get to $3 million? Well, you don't get fast at the very least to $3 million by trying to figure out how do I spend as little on marketing as humanly possible. You do have to look at spending it as a higher percentage for some amount of time. And this is really important. So let's say we're million dollars. Let's, let's do it with $1.2 million a year. So that way we get the nice round $100,000 per month revenue mark. Okay. And we say, eh, we've been spending like five, 6% of that every month on marketing. You might need to scale that to 12 or even 15% temporarily until as a percentage, it starts to represent a smaller and smaller amount. And I do like to dial it in into that seven to 12%, depending on your marketplace size, your market cap, level of competition. Obviously, I'd love it to be down as low as 5% on average, but I always like to deliver the most real and honest message possible. And I see competitive law firms that are million dollar plus are in that seven twelve percent range, so that, that's what I look for, right? And that's not you know, Charlie. About. I'm gonna I want to jump in and add one other yeah. thing to what you just said because I really think that this will this will tie it around away from the numbers back to the numbers. So one of the things that I've talked about here on the podcast and I talk about with my coaching clients all the time is that the our normal modus operandi is have do be. When I have this then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to be this, right? So when I have $3 million, then I'll be able to spend $15,000 a month on advertising. And then I'll be able to, you know, whatever, right? So the reality is, is that that's not how it happens. And when people operate from there, it takes a very long time to get to where they want to go if they get there at all because they haven't created that ability for them to step into that role. The reality is, is that if you want to have the result, you need to operate from be, do, have. I need to start being the person in that future picture first. Yes. Yes. When I start being that person, then I'm going to start doing the things I need to do. And then I'm going to have what I want, which is that $3 million revenue, right? So just using your example and just coloring it a little bit differently. 
if I want to be a $3 million firm, I need to then take the $3 million firm advertising budget and start spending it today. Yeah. And if I do that, essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking a 5% budget and I'm tripling it to 15%. And by doing that, I'm now spending what I should be spending at $3 million, spending it today. And what's going to happen is, is that I'm going to start to produce the results that an, a $3 million firm produces from a $15,000 a month advertising budget, which will then open the floodgates of new business. And clearly there's other stuff that's going to have to fall into place. And we're going to have to start operating from a $3 million level in other areas like our staffing, our systems of processes and stuff like that. But yep. it's just another way of looking at what you just said with the increasing the budget that's, that might help people wrap their brains around and say, oh, that makes sense because I'm not spending that forever. I'm spending that forever, but I'm not spending it forever as a percentage, a higher percentage of my business because as I make more revenue, the percentage is going to get more in line with where I need to be. What do you think is the the place where somebody should get started, even if they're, they've been running their firm for 10 years, if they're finally ready to say, hey, how do I treat myself like a business owner and, and start to really achieve success beyond what I've, what I've been able to do so far? Well, to answer your question, I think it, it is a, a mental shift to say, I really am running a business. What are the basic fundamental concepts that I need to make sure we're following if we're going to run a business and run it successfully. And when I first of all meet with a, a client, I always talk in terms of what I refer to as the four achievements. Uh, and I, I came up with a, a simple acronym because it's easy for me to remember. And I call it FACE, F-A-C-E. Most acronyms I forget because they don't make sense, but I can remember FACE. And so the four achievements are really number one, focus as in F. Focus is something that virtually every profession, every bright person, every entrepreneur suffers from. Because if you're a bright, talented person, we tend to be attracted by the bright, shiny object. So we need to learn to focus. The second achievement that we need to really work on very diligently is accountability. When you have people in your staff who are working alongside you, it really is important that each of us understand what we're accountable for. Without that, it's just mayhem. Thirdly is clarity. Uh, clarity is, is clarity as to what our values are, what our purpose is, who our client is, what our target market is, what we're trying to achieve. And then lastly, achievement in execution. So if we can accomplish all four of those things, and that's where I start with every client is sitting down and saying, so how do we go about doing these four uh, concepts or four achievements, which is focus, accountability, clarity, and execution. And then there are various fundamental subsets or principles that we walk through to help accomplish those four. And, and it really isn't that complicated, frankly, but it's a matter of acknowledgement that these are important and taking a step-by-step -step process. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a really good point, which is that, you know, this is not difficult. You know, people tend to overcomplicate the process of being successful at business, and it's really not hard. The thing that's hard is overcoming your own beliefs and being willing to allow latching on to something as this is the way to do it. And I think that uh, this is something that I come across with, with my own clients. But I mean, the way that we get around this is by charging enough money that they, they pay attention. But the reality is, is that if you invest in a coach, if you, if you invest in somebody to say, hey, look, I'm willing to learn something new, show me how it's done, you then need to buy into that process 100%. And it's the, the friction and the resistance that happens when you don't buy into that that causes a lack of success. Now, whether, I mean, it, it could even be your own fundamental understanding of what you need to be doing. The problem is, is that, you know, like you said, when, you know, you lack focus because you're not sure that this is the right way to get to where you want to go. And therefore, every time that something else comes across, you're like, oh, maybe that's the way to do it. Maybe that's the way to do it. And all of a sudden you're, you're, you're jumping in a hundred different directions. What I would like to sp spend some time on now is talking about uh, what Jamie does, which is her legal back office business. Um, and what her, in her experience, 
where the problems lay when you're running a law firm. Uh, what are the things that law firm owners do wrong along the way that maybe you can, by knowing better, can fix before they even become an issue? So, Jamie, I'm going to jump straight into uh, staffing. Staffing is it's a hot button. It's a hot button for me. It's a hot button for you, probably. And what I find is that um, as a law firm owner grows their firm, they don't recognize how powerful and important it is for them to step out of the role of doing any of the work. And then they get into this place where they realize how powerful it is. And then they throw people at problems um, to solve yeah. them. That's been my experience. I want to know from you. Where do you think that people might be mi taking missteps in staffing and growing their staff and, and growing their firm and perhaps a better way that they can look at it when they think that, 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 that hiring another person is going to solve the problem? Yeah, so I think a lot of times people add humans to problems that wouldn't be solved by a human. Um, and I say, I only want to pay humans to do what only humans can do. So if technology can do something, we should be relying on technology to do it. Um, I also think I see a, a resistance to change in general. And so, you know, if you've been using a software program for a really long time, I get it. Like your whole business is like wrapped up in this one tool. But if that tool sucks, it still sucks, regardless of the people that are using it, right? And that, that sort of aversion to change now creates workarounds on every single thing. And now you have to keep hiring humans because now you've got all these workarounds. So I do think um, technology problems should be solved by technology, not humans. And that's where people get into a situation where they're overstaffed. And then I also think that, that aversion to change, right, really gets in the way of them making critical business decisions that really can impact the firm. And, it, it, and the impact grows exponentially over time. You know, it feels little in the beginning, but now you get five years down the road and now you've got a really big problem that actually started five years ago. So in your experience, when you step foot into a law firm, you're typically at the end of that five-year experience where they've got a problem that was a small problem and has now become a big problem. Um, one of the things that you highlight is not using technology for what technology is there for. And it's really important for people to understand that technology does change over time. Um, but at the same time, it becomes a very difficult road to navigate to figure out which is the right tool to move to if your tool is not doing the thing that you need it to do. Um, what do you think that law firm owners should be doing in this process that they're not doing today? I think they're hanging on to older technologies just because they've always been around. Mm -hmm. um, I also think they're not maximizing the use of the technologies that they have and the real functionality. So now, for example, let's say you've got a billing software, case management software, and you're only using it for billing. Well, these tools are very powerful today, like project management. Like many of the billing and case management platforms out there, you can create templates of tasks. And yes, every case has nuances and uniqueness, but just think like every family law case or every PI volume-based firm has certain steps that you do that are the same in every case. You have to do discovery. You have to collect financials. You have to collect medical records, fill in the blank. You can launch a template of tasks in which everyone logs in and knows what they're supposed to do every day and that week. And that efficiency alone is going to improve your staff's speed at moving the cases along, your lawyer's speed at moving the cases along. That's just one example. But I see a lot of firms, they have good tools in place, but they're not fully utilizing them. Same thing with integrations. They're not fully utilizing integrations. So they might choose a software program that is like, I don't know, more of a better user experience for them, but it doesn't integrate with all their existing tools. If you're already using QuickBooks Online, maybe you shouldn't switch to my case because my case doesn't sync with QuickBooks Online, right? So don't disrupt one part of your business and just choose my case because you just like what my case looks like better than others. So I think integration is another thing I would offer and really maximizing the use of the technology that they have. Somebody in that role, they might not even know if they're ready, right? They just know they're overwhelmed. They know that they're spending way too much time in their business. They know that they're doing everything and they shouldn't be. So they they have the awareness, 
of the problem, but they don't know how to get out of it. They don't know um, what are the tasks they should be delegating. Is that something that you help them figure out when they introduce themselves to Chatterboss? Do you have some exercises you take them through to try to figure out what can we delegate? What can we help you take off your plate? And it kind of like an action plan of, of getting some of that stuff delegated and, and taken and, you know, and, and transferred over. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a system of saying um, your input is your stressors and the things that you know about your business, the things that may you consciously know that you need to delegate and outsource. And then there might be some things that are causing stress, but not in the forefront of, I know that I need to delegate and how I'm going to delegate it. So that's the way that we do the input from you. Then we process this information and we look at the priorities and we come up with a strategy together. So part Part of your onboarding is a strategy session with our team who act as delegation coaches. They've seen they've seen hundreds of uh, entrepreneurs and business owners go through this, and so that's what we do in that strategy session. What you get when you walk out of that strategy session is you will be very clear on the first one or two tasks that you will be handing off to your assistant. Um, You will know how to hand those tasks off to your assistant. And you will also, within a week after that conversation, have your six-month road plan. So um, we kind of, we take it step-by-step. We don't want to, especially somebody that's overwhelmed, a lot of the times uh, they can come to us, what I kind of consider, or they could consider them in this like too late category. I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed. I still don't know how to delegate it. Um, And so there is this kind of like chaotic uh, feeling for them. And sometimes those individuals, what they really want is to say, hi, finally, I'm ready to delegate, take all my stuff and fix it, make it better, put a bow on it. And so we always encourage individuals that are already in those stages. We still want to take it step by step. We still want to do it one project at a time. We want to take it very responsibly in order to make sure that that relationship is strong and has a solid foundation, and then we can build on top of it. So whether it's entrepreneurs, business owners that are in the early stages, kind of mid stages or later stages, we'll extract what we need from them and they can count on us for that. And one of the things that you shared that you do is you basically write internal SOPs for every single thing that's that's handed off to your team. So essentially, once I've delegated a task, you can do it over and over again, even if I didn't say, oh, I'm going to have to do this again a week from now. Uh, so the next time that I hand it to you, you just go back to your SOP and you have it. Is, does the client get visibility to those F- SOPs? Do they? Is, is this kind of a backdoor method for them to get their own SOPs written? Yes, uh, absolutely. Back door, front door, side door. Uh, this is the uh, the way for them to get SOPs created. The SOPs serve um, two purposes. One, it is almost like um, a contract between um, you and the assistant. So the assistant uh, is you are communicating with them your needs. The assistant then starts uh, em- implementing and executing. As they're implementing and executing, they're also writing this SOP. So as the client, you have the visibility um, and we encourage you to look at those uh, SOPs frequently, especially in the beginning. So you can take a look and this is your way to see is, is, did my uh, assistant misunderstand something? Like if your assistant is doing something, sometimes it's not totally visible to you that they're, maybe they're not doing it the way that you want, but they're doing it the way that they understood or the, the way that they see best. And so this is kind of your extra checks and balances to make sure that it's, um, it's being done the way that you want or a conversation for brainstorming. Hey, I see we're doing it this way. Uh, let's do it another way. The second purpose of these SOPs is that um, you have a backup assistant. So for the dedicated person that you have, there's for every client, every assistant has a backup. The backup is there in case uh, your assistant is sick, they're away on vacation, something happens life. Um, And so your backup assistant steps in on those days or weeks, sometimes months, whatever it is. And the way that they can do your work is that they're looking at your SOPs. So sometimes when the backup assistant needs to step in, this is also an opportunity, an extra stress test for those SOPs. So you know that they're up to date and their quality. 